Okay, this next video really kind of dives into the very first set of tools, which are those of what we often refer to as either active or reflective listening. And uh, those, that skill set is critical in, I would say, therapeutic uh, human service communication across the board, not just in a counseling type of scenario. But I think it's also true that this is probably the signature set of behaviors that most people are talking about when they're saying communicative, or sorry, counseling skills. The first of this set of skills is simply attending, which is the behavior of demonstrating that you're paying attention to people. And there are some don'ts and some do's here. The do's are often abbreviated, and you should know this already, and it was mentioned in the last video, by feeler. Facing the person, using eye contact, and remember eye contact should not be intensive. And also I should mention that you'll occasionally come across people for whom eye contact is not comfortable. People on the autistic spectrum, people of some cultural backgrounds, such as some First Nations groups or some uh, folks where there are uh, some Asian uh, communities where in some cases uh, age differences mean that eye contact is not welcomed. Just as a couple of examples. Leaning forward slightly. Remember we talked about the idea that we would sort of lean forward about as much as we would have to if somebody put their fist between the back of our chair and our back. An open posture meaning that we don't cross our arms, um, we don't cross our legs unnecessarily, we don't have a large artifact between us and that person such as a desk or a clipboard. Now something like a coffee table or that's down at the level of our knees is quite comfortable but other than that we want to avoid those big barriers and have a relaxed atmosphere and relaxed body language, relaxed facial expression. When we're facing the person, it's a good kind of barometer, and you won't be able to do this if you're doing it online, but in real life, to sit sort of so that you have about the distance of a coffee table between your knees. Another one I use is if your fingertips would touch the person's knees while your elbow was on, yours, on your own, you're probably in good shape. If you're standing, you need to step back and you need to use the supportive stance that we learned about earlier in another module. So a leg's length or more away and standing kind of in an L shape. Otherwise, it's too intimidating for people. Now, the nots or don'ts of attending. Make sure that you don't start a conversation with somebody when you know that it's likely you'll be interrupted. Um, if you can do things, I always wanted to say to somebody just like in the movies, Hold my calls. Well, in serious terms, you may sometimes need to say to your colleagues, hey, can you take any calls or I'm going to close the door so I can speak with this person um, and I'll ask other people to take care of other work. Um, make sure that you are um, mentally and physically ready to be there, whether it's a bathroom break or whether it's the fact that you've had a really tough day or whether it's um, the fact that you've got something really stressful on your mind. You need to kind of do a mental preparation and sometimes it means telling people you have to go to the bathroom first going in the bathroom and just getting a few deep breaths and putting some water on your face you can also tag team with people if you're not really the best person to handle it in that moment but you know the individual would be equally comfortable speaking to somebody else then you might be able to do that however there are times when you can't tag team and we need to recognize that so being open with people about what time you have and and the limitations of your setting can also be valuable. So you might say to people, hey, I've got about a half an hour right now, but if we can't finish in a half an hour, I'll finish up the half hour by scheduling another time when we can sit down. So be with people fully and physically and presently, and that's attending. The second skill is called reciprocating, sometimes called mirroring. Uh, these, this behavior really means that you're doing back to people what they're doing to you. So it could mean your body language, it could mean the words that you're using, it could mean your body position, uh, your, your, your gestures and sign uh, and, and sorry, and, uh, and uh, hand movements. It could also mean that you are uh, reflecting the tone of a person's voice. But here we have to be a bit careful because when we're reciprocating, we're not trying to be a copycat of people. We're trying to be kind of present with them, but we shouldn't just sit and mechanically try to do exactly what they're doing. If somebody scratches their nose, don't scratch your nose. But if somebody's leaning back in their chair, that's kind of your license to do the same thing. If somebody's laughing, 
that's your license to do a bit of the same thing. There is one exception to this idea of like to like reactions, and that is when people are angry. We want to make sure that we reciprocate back to people a tone if they're intensely angry or emotional that shows that we get the intensity, but we do not want to reflect back anger ourselves. So it's weird because if a person comes in the room and they're joyful, we typically reflect back not just intensity, but happiness. So we reflect back joy. Somebody comes in and says, I want a million dollars. Yay. Then you're probably going to say, wow, that's fantastic. If somebody comes in the room and says, I'm sick and tired of Joyce because she's a bitch, you have to find a way to say something that is reflective of the idea you get the drama or intensity without reflecting back that anger. And so it might sound like this. Wow, it sounds like you've had a really hard time with Joyce. And so you have to really kind of make sure that you have that intensity but no anger there. And as I mentioned in a prior video, as you go back and forth in sort of this tennis match of a communication, every time that you talk with that person, you'll probably notice that their temperature goes down a little bit and that allows you to bring yours down a little bit and then gradually you bring a person down to sort of that equilibrium, a homeostatic way of communicating, that sort of typical level. So we want to kind of just let the person see themselves in us without trying too hard to mimic people. And you know, I always pause to say this at this point. Many of you will go off and start using these skills on your spouses and your children. And I encourage you to do that. But it's, I guarantee you, a number of you are going to hear from people who say things like, Mom, stop counseling me. Or your husbands and wives will say things to you like, um, Don't use your class on me. And, uh, and that's because often we're too technique driven instead of really genuinely trying to be understanding of that person. Like I said in an earlier video, it's okay to not get it perfect if you're achieving that real connection with people. So reciprocation is, or reciprocity is a common one where people do that. Paraphrasing is one of the most important tools. Paraphrasing simply means putting in your own words what the other person has communicated to you. Typically there are two parts of this, the content and the emotions. Another way of putting it, content includes the facts and the thoughts and emotion includes the feelings and the meanings. And so we really want to emphasize the feelings and meanings, even though people will probably spend more of their time telling you the facts, telling you their thoughts. They're doing that to kind of boil it down to get to the feelings. And often the way they describe those facts, the words that they use, the tone of voice, the speed of their communication, tell you about their emotions as well. So we can reflect on what we see as well. And that's a bit of a hint about what uh, concreteness can include. So we can paraphrase back to people things that we see and hear and mostly focusing on the feelings. It's really important that you do the reading around the feelings and thought words part of the exercise in the, in the handout that I gave you by email. If you still are not clear on the difference between thought words and feeling words, see me. And don't be afraid to use the feeling wheel or other tools to help you find nuanced ways to describe a feeling for somebody. Because they may say angry and you may say frustrated or annoyed, but you're in the same zone and that's what matters. This is typically something that takes practice. And it also takes presence and thought. So after a person speaks, it's really important to skip a beat, to just take a little bit longer pause than you might think. You can let your facial expression or a sound kind of fill that space. It's like, a, hmm, or a little nod. And this will allow people to know that you really are trying to digest it. Typically, people don't know when to paraphrase. And one of the things I like to tell people is that there's this metaphor of a rally race that helps me to understand it. I, can't, I forgot to mention this metaphor I, I, when I talked about it earlier. I said I would tell you another one. I talked about the onion and its layers. Well, the metaphor of the rally race kind of works similarly. A rally is a type of car race where people go out and they run stages on mountain roads. And they don't race beside other cars. Each car leaves at a discrete time and runs these roads trying to beat the time of somebody else. And then they stop at the next checkpoint and somebody logs their time, checks to make sure that they are on the right route, and then sends them on the next uh, leg of their journey. 
in counseling, people are often much like the operators of a rally race, the officials of a rally race. They will give you a little bit of information and they will want to see you uh, make it to the next checkpoint and tell you what you did, tell, tell them what you heard and saw before they will go on to the next part. So this usually sounds like a pause. A person takes a moment or they say something like, do you understand what I mean? Or does that make any sense? Or am I making any sense? And those are usually invitations for you to paraphrase and go back. Sometimes people keep repeating the same thing over and over and over again. And that's them usually telling you, you're not doing as good a job of paraphrasing as they would like you to do. And therefore, they're not going to let you go on to the next leg of the journey. So paraphrase when there are pauses. Paraphrase when people seem to be asking you if you're following. Sometimes that happens with body language. Paraphrase if people seem to be kind of telling you over and over and over again. I can't tell you a set amount of time to do paraphrasing. Some people will need uh, you to paraphrase every few seconds and others can go on for quite a long time. What do you do when a person goes on for quite a long time? Well, that's the next technique, summarizing. Summarizing means that we really kind of want to boil it down. And so it goes with paraphrasing. There are not entirely separate ideas. In a summarizing, we give kind of a nutshell, particularly of the part that is content, of the facts and so forth. And we emphasize the feelings. One of the other things that we need to learn to do, and I've mentioned artful questioning, is open-ended questions. Questions that help the person to go to the next level of, or next layer of their onion, so to speak. And these questions typically are very, very generic. They often sound something like this. So John, I heard you describe the way that you and your wife seem to be having the same conversation over and over again and the feeling that you're really frustrated. Can you tell me more about what it is that you guys seem to talk about more often? So often as you're listening to people, you can hear them talk about something in a general or vague way. And I would typically go and explore that with one proviso. Make sure that you're not hunting for some data point. For example, this might be a way a person would do it if they were doing it wrong. So John, I heard you say that you and your wife seem to be having the same conversation over and over and over again, and it's really frustrating you. How many times would you estimate you've had that conversation with your wife? Or another alternate question that would be equally a problem. Um, what is the, the last time you had that conversation with your wife? If you really think about it, those pieces of information don't, don't keep the person talking. Open-ended questions that are really good are propelling. They involve a little bit of speaking from us and they send people on the next leg of their journey in a way that gets them talking a fair amount. So it's really important that you think about the questions that help to kind of get to the next level. Understanding meaning, understanding feelings, understanding perceptions. This absolutely takes practice. And often people can't think of the next question to do and so they immediately move to action planning. And that's one of the most common mistakes. Don't do it. Instead, pause and tell the person while you're pausing, hmm, I'm thinking of what I want to ask you. Or sometimes a person has said two things that you'd like to explore. Hmm, I'm thinking about which one I want to ask you first. And that's okay to do that. All right. The other thing you can be doing as we go along here is using what we call minimal encouragers. These are sometimes referred to informally as hell yes, sort of giving people hand gestures, nods, and vocal cues that tells, you, tells them that you're understanding them. Something like, okay, or I see, or right, okay, I follow you. And those types of pieces of communication are great because they don't suggest to the other person that you want them to stop. They don't tell people that they're being interrupted. They instead encourage people to keep going. So I would encourage you to use those tools and to practice them. Knowing when to speak is one of the most powerful things because interrupting people can really cause problems. When we interrupt people, we create a need for them to repeat the story over again. And they'll only do that a limited number of times before they give up on us. They can't tell where we stopped listening to them 
and where we started listening to our own internal script. So they usually start it all over again. And that's a bit ironic when you think about it, because typically we're trying to interrupt because we think we already understand. So we have to be very careful about interrupting. I only interrupt if I really feel like I have lost the person or if there's some serious interruption going on around me, like a fire alarm. So other than that, I typically just try to listen to the person and if I didn't completely understand, then I let them know that. I use concreteness to say I understood thing A, C, and D, but I'm still a bit confused about B. Empathy and warmth are also very important ingredients here. The idea is for us to reflect back to people that we understand them, not that we agree with them, not that we're trying to judge them or give them any kind of uh, specific advice or direction. And that's again why we want to remember all those flag words we talked about earlier. And we'll talk about some of those in our online discussions. Our open posture, our smile, getting to know our facial expressions, will really help us. Some of you naturally sit there with a smile and a comforting facial expression. Others of you may not. So it's about practicing that. It's also about practicing your tone of voice and making sure that it works for people. Avoiding barriers, disturbances, and interruptions. And making sure that we're as natural with people as we possibly can by really getting to know about and get to know them and genuinely care. Um, Trying to really be curious about people or to appreciate people is a spirit that I really encourage you to take. Listening to the other person is your first priority instead of what are you going to say next. It's probably the biggest mistake people make. I have to think about what I'm going to say next. No, you don't. If you literally sat there at the end of a person speaking and took a moment of silence and did nothing more than let the person know what you thought they said, it's amazing how often they will say, great, and continue going on. You don't necessarily need to ask them anything. And if you're not sure what to ask them, then you can just simply ask them to tell you more or ask them to expand. So we talked about this already. What happens when we're interrupted? These are the three things. We become convinced that the other person is not interested in us, or maybe another way of putting it, more interested in the thinking in their own heads. And so we start avoiding that person or anybody that looks like that person. And that's where I get really concerned when supported people start thinking that there is no such thing as a genuinely caring professional in their life because they've had so many of these types of experiences. We become convinced that we weren't heard. And so even though the interruption is often meant to speed up the communication, it often has the opposite effect. It actually extends the communication because people start over and that often leads to more interruptions. We start meta-communicating. In other words, we start talking about the conversation. For example, we might say things like, why do you keep interrupting me? Or let me finish. Or I'm finding this conversation really frustrating. And that gets in the way of us getting at the root of the material. Another way of putting that is we start adding layers to the onion instead of taking them away. So that's an introduction to the concepts of uh, active listening, empathy, and uh, paraphrasing and summarizing. Try using them now in initial role plays with your teammates or your partners. This is really important. I'd like to see each of you start using the format I'll describe in our classroom discussion or our Zoom discussion about how to actually practice and then evaluate. But here's a hint, it'll be very similar to what you did in the critical incidents stress debriefing role plays.